Okay, so we're going to have a quick chat about um, what the alternated battery charger does and how do you install it and basically we'll come through why you need it. The first drawing is your standard uh, setup as you would have in any um, vehicle uh, like a camper van. This is the sort of standard fitting that is used on pretty much all you know, camper vans. You have, if you look at it, you have the alternator produces the power. It goes down to the starter motor connection, then goes up the from the starter motor to the starter battery. That's all in the vehicle system, and you really don't want to be getting involved with that, especially with the newer Euro 5 or Euro 6 engines plus, which have the smart alternator system on them. I'll describe what the smart alt alternator system is later on in a separate video, otherwise this will get quite clumsy. Um, so this particular discussion is going to be about older vehicles pre about mm, 2011, 2012, prior to the Euro 5, Euro 6 and prior to the smart alternators. So this is the old type vehicles. Your alternator will produce 14 volts and work its way around the drawing that I have made for drawing number one. When the power then leaves the vehicle, as in the standard vehicle system, it goes to the distribution box, which is um, an integral part of any camper van. It's a very integrated system, which has got tank gauges, uh, water levels, um, voltage monitoring, etc., all built into the, into the one box. It's fine, it does what it says it does on the tin, the trouble is it's designed for going from campsite to campsite, as we've said before. So this is the conventional site-to-site -site electrical layout for a camper van. So the, we know you're limited to 20 amps going into that box because, as we've explained before, the first fuse you come to is 20 amps. So you simply can't put more than that in, otherwise you will um, damage the, uh, the fuse. Um, now, the things to be aware of this is that... Um, Okay, I'll leave that. Things to be aware of things out. Um, okay, so you've got the 20 amps going into the box. It's then going out the box through a relay or some form of switching device to the auxiliary battery system. As I said before, this works and this is fine for your site-to-site -site electrical layout. But you're only going to charge at 15 odd amps. What you want to do is, if you want to do wild side camping, you want to be able to charge at 60 or 100 amps or even 150 amps and plus. Now we do three different products here. We've got a 60 amp battery to battery charger, a 120 amp battery to battery charger and there's a new 180 amp coming through. Um, right, so how do you fit this and why do you fit this? If we go to the second page, which we'll call it the wild side camping electrical layout page. As you can see, um, first of all, we've increased the number of batteries in the secondary system, purely because one 80 amp battery is simply no use for wild side camping. You want to be able to generate a lot of power and then store that power. So there's just no point in trying to do a wild side system with you know one battery. So I've put four batteries on there. I would advise some in the region of 400 amp hours for a wild side version minimum. If you can put more on, that's fine. You've never heard anyone complaining about having too much power. It's always about having too little. So let's assume you put on 400 amp hours of batteries. Then in order to charge that, we really need to be looking at the larger unit. So the first thing to establish really is what size is your vehicle alternator. There's no point putting a 120 amp battery to battery charger on if your alternator is 60 amps you know there's no problem you're not going to do any damage you're just wasting your money so remember that if an alternator is rated at for example 120 amps your average driving around and surplus power is probably around the 60 to 70 amp mark so even a 120 amp alternator the 60 amp battery to battery charger would be fine because realistically that's all you're going to have to play with. But a lot of certainly the more modern vehicles, certainly the new Fords, transit type vehicle and the Mercedes Sprinters etc are 
fitting alternators up around the 180 to 250 amp range. Now there's a reason for that. Um, it's because of the smart alternator thing, which I've referred to before, which if you've got a more modern vehicle, look at the program we're doing regarding smart alternator regenerative braking. So there's a reason for larger alternators appearing on vehicles. Absolutely nothing to do with camper vans. It's a much more complex reason for that. But we can utilize that, so it's a good thing. So you simply put a much thicker wire, um, check the gauge required. I've drawn it deliberately quite thick directly to the battery to battery charger. You could put it from the battery, but invariably the alternator wiring between the alternator and the starter motor isn't particularly great. Um, the wire there tends to be quite thin. So experience tells me you're better just running a new wire, really thick, like welding cable, directly from the alternator. But as I said before, you can run it from the starter battery. Uh, to the battery to battery charger, simply out the other side, directly onto the new battery bank you have created. Now, by doing that, you're still allowing the consumption to go into the distribution box for your normal vehicle use. We're not changing that. Um, there is one little thing that I would suggest you look at really carefully is your fridge on board. Normally, the fridge aeration system on camper vans has got a multiple input fridge so you sometimes have 240 volts and 12 volt input. It's really important that on the 12 volt input side, it's a 12 volt compressor fridge and not a thermoelectric fridge. The thermoelectric fridges, they do work, they do cool things down, but they're horrendously inefficient. You'll probably use something like 10 to 12 amps an hour, where a compressor fridge would probably average one to two amps per hour which is a tremendous difference um, from the point of view of eating up your battery bank. So really, do look at that fridge. Make sure it's a compressor 12-volt type and not a thermoelectric type. If it's thermoelectric, get rid of it if you want wild side camping. No use to you. Um, so we've now got the power into the distribution box. If you look at the original wire that was going to the vehicle starter battery, I put a big cross on it to remove the old connection. So somewhere on the starter battery, you don't have to rip the wire out of the vehicle, but somewhere on the starter battery, there will be a live feed, one wire, which is feeding into that distribution box. Simply track which wire that is. Just pull the wire off and see if the, uh, camp, the domestic side goes dead. That's your wire. And just pull it off, tape it up, fold it back out of the way, make sure it can't touch anything it's well and safely secured and it's always there then you can always put it back on again for emergencies or whatever um, so just remove that old connection and that stops you creating a loop where the battery to battery charger feeds into the batteries feeds through the box feeds back through the old system and back onto the starter battery and then just creates this loop unnecessary um, and uh, just remove that and the difference here is you will be able to fit things like inverters. Usually wild side camping people um, put an inverter on for hair dryers or something like that there. So you can comfortably fit an, an inverter and then you would just switch your engine on for an hour in the morning. That'll heat your hot water up. It will boost charge into the batteries, give you 120 or 140, 160 amps into your battery bank and probably half an hour in the morning um, will do the job. So that's really what or how you fit um, the battery battery charger. So uh, it's quite simple, very effective, increases your charging from about 15 amps to, in this case here, 120 amps. But more important than the speed of which you're going to charge, your older system would never fully charge the batteries. You're only going to put about 70 to 80 percent into the battery so if you've got say a 100 amp hour battery and you're only filling it to 80 percent and then it's useless at about 40 percent you're only working on about you know 50 60 percent of the battery where if you can fill it right up then you will get a lot more juice in which hang on go back to the the mass and that so if you have so i see more importantly is the fact that your conventional system will never fully charge your battery bank. So say for the sake of argument, you have a 100 amp hour battery. 
Well, you can only charge it up to about 80% using your conventional system. And at 40%, it's pretty useless, your battery's flat. So you're only using 40% of the uh, battery capacity anyway. If you can fill it up to that 100%, then you get another 20%. You're literally putting another 50% um, capacity into your batteries. This also makes them sharper and makes them last longer as well. So you've got a digital, digitally controlled four-step constant current charging curve built into this. Um, but I say, if you've got a more modern engine, you need to add on to this. Go onto our website and look at the lecture regarding regenerative braking. Okay, that's that done. So let's go to the regenerative braking. Right, uh, you'll have to pull up page the graphs on page 13, things like that there for, you know, doing this lecture. Okay, this lecture is based on regenerative braking or smart alternators that are on Euro 5, Euro 6 and probably Euro Plus. So Euro 7, Euro 8. This isn't going to go away. It's too good an um, idea and it's also got the ability to uh, improve. Uh, so basically what they're trying to do is, or they're succeeding in doing, shall I say, is to get more miles per gallon basically out of your vehicle and also get more, um, sorry, so basically what they're trying to do is reduce greenhouse gases, reduce, reduce the CO2 emissions and to get you better MPG from your vehicle. Now the way to do that is to be more um, aware of where you can get free energy from your vehicle. And one of the best ways to get free energy from your vehicle, if you think about it, is when you're braking or when the vehicle's slowing down, all the inertial energy in the vehicle is being dissipated into heat on your brakes. So you're literally just wasting the energy when you slow down the vehicle. Now, the ideal system would be to recover that energy, like you do with, say, a Tesla electric car. When you take the foot of the accelerator, the electric motor reverses and becomes a generator and feeds a lot of juice or electric back into the battery and it recovers that energy and stores it again. So we're trying to get as much free energy as possible. Now what they've come up with, which is a great idea and it works fine, is that when you start the vehicle now, the alternator goes up to about 15 volts. That puts a lot of power quickly back into the battery because you've just started the vehicle. Now this is the crucial thing. The electronic control system specifically tells the alternator do not fully charge the starter battery. We want 20% empty. So that is an inherent flaw for secondary systems from absolute scratch. No matter what you do, you cannot fully charge a battery. That's part of this new system. So the secondary battery, or the, sorry, the starter battery Right, we'll go back a wee bit. Um, so the alternator will start to charge the battery. As soon as it gets to about 80% full, the alternator is told to drop from 15 volts or 14.8 or whatever, down to about 12.4. Now 12.4 is a very important voltage. At 12.4 volts, the alternator will produce, it'll produce the same amount of amps. It can produce 200 amps if it's a 200 amp alternator. It's just at 12.4 volts. Now 12.4 volts, if you've got the windscreen wipers working or the headlights working or something like that, the alternator will produce electric to keep them running. But it will allow the battery to discharge a little bit down to the sort of magic 80 to 75%. Now at that voltage, it will never charge the battery anymore. Then when you take your foot off the accelerator or put your foot on the brake, the ECU says to the alternator, right, we want to get some free electric here. We need to do it fast and we need to put it somewhere. So the alternator shoots away up to about 15 volts. At this voltage, the alternator is going to fire out its full current into your starter battery. So your starter battery must be empty enough to receive that high current. So during that phase of slowing down or braking, the alternator goes absolutely mental fires out all the juice, it goes into the battery, the battery absorbs it and stores it, and there is your free energy. Now, it's now in the battery, which is pretty useless, so when you then start to accelerate off or drive under normal conditions, 
the voltage of the alternator drops back down to about 12.4 and then all that energy that you've put in, the free energy, comes out. So it leaks into the system to run your headlights, your windscreen wipers, your whatever else you're running and allows that battery to drop down again to 80%. And then the next time you put your foot on the brake, it shoots back up again or you slow down. So it's, it's, a, it's a low cost uh, energy recovery system. Now the obvious, the obvious progression of this, which is um, you know, why you're seeing larger alternators being fitted, is that uh, to take the windings out of the alternator and instead of just charging the battery, when you take off or you accelerate off, the windings reverse on the alternator to become a motor. So that when you accelerate off, instead of uh, just using the electric slowly, you could actually turn the alternator into a little electric motor and produce maybe 10, 15 horsepower, which would assist the acceleration of the vehicle, which is where you use all your energy. I mean, when you're driving around town, you may have a 100 horsepower engine, but in reality, you're probably running around with 10 to 15 horsepower if you're being sensible. So if you could get a, like a 10 horsepower boost during the actual acceleration phase, you could really help your miles per gallon here. But that hasn't happened yet, but I'm pretty sure in the future that will happen. So you've got, a, you've got a toned down version of that. This is sort of phase one you're on. So it works well. It works great. If you look at the drawings that we put on the screen, you can actually see a test that we uh, did with Ford, uh, Ford Transit. And you can see how the voltage swings up and down, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now it does the vehicle, it does the energy recovery thing. Uh, it reduces the CO2 emissions. It's part of the when you buy a vehicle, you get a stamp saying this is um, emissions, blah blah blah. It's part of all that. So you can't really just come in and go, well, let's remove that because if you remove that, you've removed the certification regarding the emissions of that vehicle. So it's here and it's here to stay and it's probably going to get worse from the point of view of it's going to get more complex, there's going to be other things. So it's not going away. Now, when you fit an auxiliary battery onto the system, the cheap way of which vehicle manufacturers have been doing for years is simply link the two batteries together with a split charge relay. Now, on paper this seems okay, but let's look at it in reality. So you've got your secondary battery system on and obviously you want to charge that secondary battery system as you're driving from A to B to C to D. Now the first and the crux of the problem is the software is told not to fully charge the starter battery. Well of course if you've joined the starter battery to the secondary system the same information replies the secondary battery can never be fully charged because that's the whole crux of the regenerative braking system. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is when the battery voltage drops away down on your secondary system, so you could have stopped somewhere and you, you're using your secondary battery through an inverter, doing whatever you're doing. So in effect, your secondary battery, let's say for the sake of arguments, empty. So you drive up the road, the relay engages and you go on to the regen braking mode and you hit 15 volts. Well, now you've got a really dangerous situation. You've got a secondary battery that's empty. You've got an alternator that's shot up to around 15 volts. You're going to get a massive flow of current into that secondary battery. Your cabling better be 150 amps all the way. Your relay better be able to deal with 150 amps because that's what's coming down that, that line. Now that sounds in principle great. Uh, it's wonderful we're putting 150 amps into the secondary battery system. But if you look at the specification of your secondary battery system, it'll probably be AGM or JL or whatever, and you'll find maximum charge voltage is 14.4 volts. You're now charging at about 15 volts. Um, maximum charge current will be about 0.2 C, which is probably, say, 100 amps, it would be 20 to 40 amps, depending on how many batteries you have there. It might be 60, 80, 100 amps. So you're probably um, charging way too fast and at way too high voltage. So you're effectively starting to destroy your secondary battery system. And at the end of the day, you're still never going to fully charge it. Uh, so what's the solution? Um, well, the solution is the battery to battery charger. Now what it does 
is it takes the feed from the starter battery and then feeds to the domestic battery bank or the secondary battery bank. Now the crux of this product has got two functions. The first function is when the voltage drops to 12.4 volts or whatever, this product takes the 12.4 volts and boosts it up to whichever voltage you programmed it for. There's preset voltages in this. You program the unit for say AGM batteries. So if you've got 12.2 volts going into this or 12.4 going in, you will get 14.4 coming out at 60, 100 amps, whatever you need it, to set it at, it'll come out of this, but it will be at the battery's desired voltage. Then the second problem is when the starter battery voltage shoots up to you know 15 volts, this unit here will actually take the 15 volts into it and drop it down to 14.4 volts. Also it's current limiting so you can have a 250 amp alternator and say you might only want 60 amps. So you put a 60 amp one of these on, it doesn't matter if you have 250 amp alternator, you're only going to get 60 amps through the box. So it's current limiting, it's voltage increase and it's voltage decrease and then you're charging your secondary battery based on a four step constant current charging curve. So in effect what this unit's doing is saying, I really don't care what your primary battery's doing, I'm going to charge the secondary battery correctly, fully, and regardless of what you're doing. So it's a, it's a vital piece of equipment. Um, a lot of people don't want to use it because of the cost, and we have many fleet operators who have come back to us six months later going, we didn't use this, boy, was that a mistake. We have really destroyed a lot of systems, destroyed a lot of uh, equipment, and destroyed a lot of batteries. So um, much as people don't want to spend the money on this, to a large extent they really don't have much of a choice. Um, it's just a very um, fast learning curve to go from 2.50 for a little cheap 50 amp relay to what these cost, big jump. So it's very difficult for them to get their head around, but it is happening, uh, make no mistake, um, and it is the way forward as it's not going to get any better. So that's really what regenerative braking is in a nutshell. Okay, thank you.